So in this chapter here, chapter 10, we start to look at an overview of biotechnology. So this is just to give you an idea of some of the things that we can do with biotechnology. It's not going to be a detailed how to do biotechnology by a long shot. So on the left is a picture of a thermocycler. And these days, this is a basic tool used to study DNA in a process called the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. What this is used for is helping to basically amplify the amount of DNA so that you can make sure you've got enough of it to work with in the lab. So the polymerase enzyme most often used with PCR actually comes from a strain of bacteria that lives in the hot springs at Yellowstone National Park. So here's a picture of those hot springs. So this diagram shows a basic method that's used for the extraction of DNA. This is actually very easy to do. It, the DNA can be a little bit fragile and finicky, so you do need to make sure if you're doing this type of lab that you're observant of using the correct temperatures to do things. So you start out with your cells. They get lysed in a detergent that helps to disrupt the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane will fall apart and the contents are going to be treated with a protease enzyme that will destroy protein and RNAs to destroy the RNA. What you'll be left with are cell debris that can be pelleted in a centrifuge. It will spin it around quickly to separate things based on the size. The supernatant or the liquid containing the DNA then gets transferred into a clean tube. You can precipitate out the DNA with ethanol and it will form these viscous strands that can be spooled onto a glass rod. You just need to make sure that the ethanol is cool enough and that you're nice and gentle with this. You want to spool it, you don't want to stir it to pull it off. When you have DNA that can be cut into fragments and run on a gel. So here is an example of a gel that's been run using gel electrophoresis. DNA has a charge, so when you make this gel, basically you are separating the fragments based on their size, and what's causing the fragments to actually move through this gel is they have a charge to them, so they will migrate to the opposite charge in an electric field. So here are shown DNA fragments from six samples that are run on a gel and then it's viewed under UV light. So here you would have a scale that's put on and then you would have one, two, three, four, five, six different samples. And you can see that they're cut in different places. The larger fragments are going to be slower to move. The smaller fragments are going to move faster. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, this is the one that's used to amplify the DNA. It allows you to make many copies of a DNA from a specific sequence of DNA using a form of DNA polymerase. So you start out with your double-stranded DNA. It will be denatured at 95 degrees Celsius. You're going to add in the appropriate primers, and you'll begin annealing at about 50 degrees Celsius. And then you add in your base pairs with the DNA polymerase, and you'll begin the extension where you're going to grow the complementary DNA strand using the DNA polymerase. And this is at about 72 degrees. So you go from having one fragment of DNA to having two copies of it. Then you can go from two to four, four to eight, and so on. So this used to have to be done by hand where you would add each of these different enzymes in and you would move them into different temperatures of water baths. That's where the thermocycler comes in now. You're able to put it into a machine. You basically put the lid down, push a button, and wait a couple hours and you come out with amplified copies of your DNA. One of the things we can use is enzymes to cut the DNA in different places. And these are going to be called restriction enzymes. Here we show a six nucleotide restriction enzyme recognition site. So what's going to happen is you've got a sequence of six nucleotides that reads the same in both the five prime to three prime direction. So if you're reading five prime to three prime here, it's G G A T C C. If you're reading it here, it's G G A T C C. 
Africa. We call those palindromes. So what it does to one strand in the five prime to three prime direction, it will do to the complementary strand. What the restriction enzyme is gonna do is make a break in the DNA strand. When it does this, sometimes you can have it cut in the same place and we call them blunt ends, but what is actually a lot more useful to us is to cut it and make sticky ends. So here it's still got its complementary piece on the end, but all of these are exposed. And then on the other half, it still has its complementary piece here on the end, and all of these parts of the fragment are exposed. So what happens is when you take another piece of DNA and you cut it with the same enzyme, where it's gonna look for the same sequence, you'll create a pair of complementary sticky ends so that you will have a piece that will fit in specifically to this exposed area on both sides. That way you can insert the desired piece of DNA that may contain a gene into this place where you have these sticky ends. And then you would use enzymes to ligate those together. So this is what's done in molecular cloning. So you have your piece of foreign DNA here, and a lot of times this is done with a plasmid, which is a mobile genetic element that are used a lot in bacteria. So you're going to cut both the foreign DNA and the plasmid with the same restriction enzyme. Once that occurs, you will end up with complementary sticky ends. The restriction site's only going to occur once in the plasmid in the middle of the gene for the enzyme LAXI. So you would specifically, when you're choosing the enzyme, you would know the sequence that you wanted to cut and you just order the appropriate enzyme to do that. They are commercially available. However, they are not just sold to individuals at their house, they are sold to specific places that actually have a use for it so that you're not having this type of technology being done in somebody's basement and potentially making genetically modified organisms at home. So you've got your sticky ends that are complementary here on your foreign DNA and on your plasmid. And so what you have here is an ampicillin resistance gene. This is your laxy gene. So the restriction enzymes leave the complementary sticky ends on the foreign DNA fragment and the plasmid. This allows the foreign DNA to be inserted into the plasmid when the sticky ends anneal. So you'll add DNA ligase to reattach the DNA backbones, and now you have your recombinant plasmids. So bacteria will take up plasmids with or without the insert. They may not take up the plasmid at all. Your plasmids get combined with the culture of living bacteria. So because many of the bacteria do not take the plasmids up into the cells, you can have plasmids that do not have foreign DNA in them, and a few will take up the recombinant plasmids. This means we're going to need to separate things. So here the bacteria that take up the recombinant plasmid cannot make the enzyme from the gene that the fragment was inserted into the laxi because you've cut the gene. They also carry a gene for resistance to the antibiotic ampicillin, which was on the original plasmid. So to find the bacteria that have the recombinant plasmid, the bacteria are grown on a plate with the antibiotic ampicillin and a substance that changes colors when exposed to the enzyme produced by the laxi gene. The ampicillin will kill any bacteria that did not take up the plasmid and the color of the substance will not change when the gene for the laxi contains foreign DNA. These are the bacteria with the recombinant plasmids that we want to grow. So this will allow you to be able to identify the colonies that have the gene that you've inserted. So looking at it on a bigger picture, genetic Engineering and manipulation has occurred a lot in plants, but we also have done a little bit with animals. And this is where Dolly comes in. Dolly the sheep was the first agricultural animal to be cloned. In order to create Dolly, they took the nucleus that was removed from a donor egg cell. So here is the first nuclear donor here. You'll notice this is a sheep with a white face here. It's a fin dorset. So we took 
the mammary cells, and then we have the cytoplasmic donor. So you had to take the cytoplasm from another sheep. Here you took those mammary cells with the nucleus and genetic information and used a direct current pulse to put it into this cytoplasmic donor. And then it turned into, it became fertilized and it became the blastocyst here. Then it was implanted in a separate surrogate ewe and then Dolly the sheep was born. So it wasn't that she was created entirely in a petri dish. It did take three different sheep to make this. You had a nuclear donor, an egg donor, and then you had the surrogate that was actually going to carry that egg and let it develop. So the nucleated egg was placed into the other cell. When they were shocked, they fused. They were shocked again to start division. The cells were allowed to reach the early embryonic stage before implanted into the surrogate mother. So with Dolly, this, it was a success because they were able to create this. However, it was also important, we learned that there's also a lot of other cytoplasmic signals. So Dolly ended up having a lot of the signals that came from the cytoplasm of another cell that was in another state. So we got some results we didn't quite expect there as well. So this diagram here is going to show the steps that are involved with curing a disease with gene therapy using an adenovirus vector. So this gene therapy right now is something that is still in a research phase. It is not something that is regularly used. So what you would use is this modified DNA would get injected into this virus vector. So you would have viral DNA, your inserted gene, and more viral DNA. Then essentially you let that virus infect the cell. The vector, your virus, is going to bind to the cell membrane. It gets packaged in a vesicle. The vesicle will break down and release the vector it's going to use the cells, host cells machinery to make the protein using the new gene. So here we can see some transgenic mice. They've actually had a gene implanted in them that causes them to fluoresce under UV light. It's not that fluorescent mice was actually really useful to the mice, but it was a way for us to be able to see indeed that we did get a gene implanted and see a visible difference. So in the middle you have the non-transgenic mouse who does not have the gene that fluoresces. Corn is a major agricultural crop and a variety of industries used it. It has been modified tremendously through plant biotechnology. So some of these types of corn you would never even see. What you're used to probably seeing is this type of corn, but there were several other types of corn that used to exist, we do just grow a few varieties now that have been genetically modified to meet our needs. This is an example of a physical map of a human chromosome. This is the X chromosome. So you can see where you would have different genes follow along. Here are some genes that correspond to certain diseases. Sometimes there are going to be multiple genes that can go wrong involved with certain diseases, particularly with cancer. It's not often not as simple as just looking at one gene gone wrong to cause a disease. For other things it is. A lot of research is being done with model organisms such as the mouse. Mice are easy to contain. They're easy to feed, easy to keep alive, easy for us to study. Another one, the Drosophila melanogaster, is a fruit fly that has been studied. We've used the nematode here, the yeast sarcomyces, and the common weed. All have been subjects that we've studied genetics with. Metagenomics involves isolating the DNA from multiple species within an environmental niche. The DNA gets cut up and sequenced, 
and then it will allow the entire genome sequences of multiple species to be reconstructed from the sequences of overlapping pieces. So here you start out, each color represents DNA from a different species. You've got the orange, purple, and the green. All the genomic DNA from a particular environment is going to be cut into fragments and ligated into a cloning vector. These fragments are sequenced and the regions of overlap are used to determine the genomic sequences. So genetic research does play a part in many other fields. It's been used to look at renewable fuel, fuels that were tested in Navy ships and aircraft at the first Naval Energy Forum. A lot looked at with diseases. This is Bacillus anthracis. It's the organism that is causes anthrax. So not only looking at it as potential bioweapons, but also looking at how can we study the genomics and try and find cures to diseases or prevent diseases. In agriculture, these are some transgenic agricultural plants that are useful for resisting disease. These transgenic plums resist the plum pox virus. And a lot of these things have been automated here. So that is what's really sped up our gen genomics research is the ability to automate a lot of these processes. So this machine is preparing to do proteomic pattern analysis to identify specific cancers so that an accurate cancer prognosis can be made. So commonly when a person does have cancer and they take a biopsy, they will look at the genetics of that tumor to help in the diagnosis and in some cases be able to plan to give a specific treatment that's going to target exactly where the genetics have gone wrong in that cell. So that is still very early phases in research, but we are hoping to be able to do more of that.